Thursday, uh, June 18th, 2020. A Burning, a novel by Megha Majumdar. For my mother and father who have made everything possible. Jeevan. You smell like smoke, my mother said to me. So I rubbed an oval of soap in my hair and poured a whole bucket of water on myself before a neighbor complained that I was wasting the morning supply. There was a curfew that day. On the main street, a police jeep would creep by every half hour. Daily wage laborers compelled to work would come home with arms raised to show that they had no weapons. In bed, my wet hair spread on the pillow. I picked up my new phone, purchased with my own salary, screen guard still attached. On Facebook, there was only one conversation. The terrorists attacked the wrong neighborhood. Hashtag Kolabagan train attack. Hashtag undefeated. Friends, if you have 50 rupees, skip your samosas today and donate to hyphen. The more I scrolled, the more Facebook unrolled. This news clip exclusively from 24 hours shows how candlelight vigil at the night before I had been at the railway station no more than a 15 minute walk from my house. I ought to have seen the men who stole up to the open windows and threw flaming torches into the halted train. But all I saw were carriages burning, their doors locked from the outside and dangerously hot. The fire spread to the huts bordering the station, smoke filling the chests of those who lived there. More than a hundred people died. The government promised compensation to the families of the dead. 80,000 rupees, which, well, the government promises many things. In a video to the dozen microphones thrust at his chin, the chief minister was saying, let the authorities investigate. Unquote. Somebody had spliced this comment with a video of policemen scratching their heads. It made me laugh. I admired these strangers on Facebook who said anything they wanted to. They were not afraid of making jokes. Whether it was about the police or the ministers, they had their fun and it wasn't that freedom. I hope that after a few more salary slips, after I rose to that to be a senior sales clerk at Pantaloons, I would be free in that way too. Then, in a video clip further down the page, a woman came forward, her hair flying, her nose running, a wet trail down to her lips, her eyes red. She was standing on the sloping platform of our small railway station. Into the microphone, she screamed. There was a jeep full of policemen right there. Ask them why they stood around and watched while my husband burned. He tried to open the door and save my daughter. He tried and tried. I shared that video. I added a caption. Policemen paid by the government watched and did nothing while this innocent woman lost everything, I wrote. I laid the phone next to my head and dozed. The heat brought sleep to my eyes. When I checked my phone next, there was only two likes. A half hour later, still two likes. Then a woman, I don't know who, commented on my post. How do you know this person is not faking it? Maybe she wants attention. I sat up. Was I friends with this person? In her profile picture, she was posing in a bathroom. Did you even watch the video? I replied. The words of the heartless woman drifted in my mind. I was irritated by her, but there was excitement too. This was not the frustration of no water in the municipal pump or power cut on the hottest night. 
Wasn't this a kind of leisure dressed up as agitation? For me, uh, the day was a holiday, after all. My mother was cooking fish so small we would eat them bones and tail. My father was taking in, in the sun, his back pain eased. Under my thumb, I watched post after post about the train attack. Earn 50 likes, 100 likes, 300 likes. Nobody liked my reply. And then, in the small glowing screen, I wrote a foolish thing. I wrote a dangerous thing, a thing nobody like me should ever think, let alone write. Forgive me, Ma. If the police didn't help ordinary people like you and me, if the police watched them die, doesn't that mean, I wrote on Facebook, that the government is also a terrorist? Outside the door, a man slowly pedaled his rickshaw, the only passenger, his child, the horn going paw-paw for her glee. Chapter 2 Lovely Sunday morning, time to go to acting class. With my hips swinging like this and like that, I am walking past the guava cellar. Brother, I am calling. What's the time? 8.30, he is grumbling because he is not wishing to share with me the fruits of his wristwatch. Leave him. I am abandoning my stylish walk and running like a horse to the local station. On the train, while I am touching my chest and forehead, saying a prayer for those poor people who were dying a few days ago at this very station. Who is pushing? One aunt is shouting. Stop it. This hijra couldn't find a different compartment to hassle. The peanut seller is hissing, as if I am not having ears. Nothing is simple for a person like me. Not even one hour on the train. My chest is a man's chest and my breasts are made of rags. So what? Find me another woman in this whole city, as truly woman as me. In the middle of this crowd, a legless beggar is coming down the corridor, sitting on a wheeled plank of wood, which he is rolling on everybody's feet. Give me one coin, he is whining. People are yelling at him. Now you need to pass? No ice or what? Where will I stand? On your head? Now he is also shouting back. Let me cut off your legs, then you see how you manage. It is true to God making me laugh and laugh. This is why I am thinking I am liking the local trains. You can be burning one train but you cannot be stopping our will to go to work, to class, to family, if we have them. Every local train is like a film. On the train, I am observing faces, body movements, voices, fights. This is how people like me are learning. When this train is swaying, picking up sweet, wind whipping in my hair, I am putting my fingertips on the ceiling making my body straight and tall for Mr. Deban's acting class. At, at Mr. Deban's house, he is resting in a chair, drinking tea from a saucer. That way the tea is cooling fast and he is not having to do foo-foo. I have heard of acting coaches who are taking advantage of strugglers, but Mr. Deban is not like that. He is having morals. In his younger days, he was getting a chance to direct a film himself, but the opportunity was in Bombay. So he was having to go to Bombay for six months minimum. At that time, his old mother was in a hospital. What kind of monster would abandon his mother to chase his dreams? 
so he was sacrificing his own goals and staying with his mother. When he was telling us this sad story, it was the only time I was seeing him cry. Next to his feet are six other students, Vrijesh, who is working as an electrician, Rumeli, who is selling magic ointment for rashes, Pionji, who is working as a clerk in the insurance office, Radha, who is studying how to be a nurse, and Joita, who is doing bookkeeping in her father's pen refill business. Nobody is really sure what Kumar is doing because he is only laughing in answer to all questions. We are all saving and saving and handing over 50 rupees each class. Today in this living room, which is our stage, we are pushing the dining table to one side and practicing a scene in which a man is being suspicious of his wife. After some, if it can be said, lackluster uh, performances, it is my turn. I am placing my phone on the floor to record myself for study purposes, then going to the center of the room and rolling my neck, left to right, right to left. Mr. Deban's deceased parents, please pray for them, are looking at me with strict faces from photos on the wall. I am feeling hot even though the fan is running on maximum speed. Time for my artistic performance. This time my partner is Brigesh, the electrician. According to that script that Mr. Debant is giving us, Brigesh, now the suspicious husband, is having to hold my shoulders forcefully, angrily. But he is holding my shoulders too lightly. I am being forced to leave my character. Not like that, I am saying. If you are holding me like a petal, how will I have the strong feeling? You have to give it to me, the anger, the frustration, come on. Mr. Debant is approving of this. If you are not feeling it, he is always saying, how will your audience be feeling it? So I am hitting Brigesh's shoulder a little making him a bit angry, showing him that he can be a little more manly with me. He is mumbling something, so I am saying, What? Say it loudly. After a long time, Brijesh is finally saying, Oof, don't make me say it loudly. I can do this marriage scene with a half-man. At this time, the clock is gonging 11 times, making us all silent. My cheeks are getting hot. Oh, I am used to this on the road, on the train, at the shops. But in my acting class? With Brijesh? So I am just throwing away his insult. It is garbage. Listen, Brijesh, I am saying. You are like my brother. So if I can act romantic with you, then you can act also romantic with me. That's right, Mr. Debant is saying. If you are serious about films, you have to be fully in your role. He is giving Brijesh a real lecture. When he is pausing, you can even hear the ticking of the big clock on the wall. Finally, Brijesh is joining his hands to beg forgiveness for me, per Mr. Deban's suggestion, and I am having a few tears in my eyes also. Rumeli is blowing her nose into her dupatta. Mr. Deban is clapping his hands and saying, channel this emotion into your scene. The moment is full of tension. The other students are putting their mobile phones away when I am roaring, you have the audacity to hit a mother. This character's rage, I am feeling it in my chest. This living room with chairs and table pushed to the corner with cabinet full of dusty teddies is nothing less than a stage in Bombay. 
The tube light is as bright as a spotlight shining on me. Outside, a pillow filler is walking by, twanking his cotton sorting instrument like a harp. Only windows with thin curtains are separating me from nobodies on the street. Then, holding the emotion but lowering my voice, I am delivering the next line. Have you not fallen from your mother's womb? Bridges. Mother, ha, as if you have the dignity. You think I don't know about him? Me. I swear it's not what you're thinking. Let me explain. Oh, please give me one chance to explain. Bridges, stone-faced, looking out of imaginary window. Me. I was never wanting to talk about my past, but you are forcing me now. So I have to tell you my secret. It is not me who has been with this man. It is my twin sister. What dialogue? The scene ends. My palms are chilled and sweating, but my heart is light like a kite. There is thundering silence in the room. Even the maid is watching from the doorway, both broom and dustpan in her hand. Her jaw is falling open. Seeing her, I am feeling like smiling. I am finally coming out to the scene and back into the room. Mr. Debant is looking a bit crazed. This is how you do it, he said, whispering. His eyes are big. He is trying to put on his sandals and stand up from the chair. But one sandal is sliding away every time he is putting his foot on it. Never mind. He is looking very serious. My students? See how she used her voice? He is saying. See how she was feeling it? And that feeling was being transferred to you? My spit is flying from his mouth, showering the heads of his students. Radha, who is sitting below him, is tearing a corner of the newspaper on the floor. Then she is wiping her hair with it. Almost one year ago, I was coming to Mr. Devnath's house for the first time. He was asking to take my interview in the street because... He was saying, this was his explanation, the house was being painted so there was nowhere to sit. Rubbish. Where were the painters, the rags, the buckets, the ladders? I was knowing the truth. The truth was that Mrs. Devnath was not wanting a hijra in the house. So I was standing in the street making sure a rickshaw passing was not hitting my behind. Mr. Debnath was saying, Why are you so bent on acting? It's too hard. My coal was smearing and my lipstick was gone on some cup of tea. My armpits was chinking, my black hair was absorbing all the heat of the day and giving me a headache. But this was the one question I was always able to answer. I have been performing all my life, I was saying to him. I was performing on trains, on roads. I was performing happiness and cheer. I was performing divine connection. Now, I was telling him, just let me practice for the camera. Today, I am standing up and joining my hands. I am bowing. What else to do when there is so much clapping? They are clapping and clapping. My fans. My bookkeeper fan. My ointment seller fan. My insurance clerk fan. Even when I am waving my hand, smiling too broadly, saying, Stop it. They are going on clapping.
जीवन A few nights later there was a knocking It was late 2 or 3 a.m. when any sound brings your heart to your throat My mother was shouting Wake up wake up A hand reached out of the dark and dragged me up in my nighty I screamed and fought believing it was a man come to do what men do but it was a police woman My father on the floor his throat dry and his painful back rigid mewled night time turned him into a child then i was in the back of the police van watching through the wire mesh a view of roads glowing orange under street lamps i exhausted myself appealing to the police woman and group of policemen sitting in front of me Sister what is happening I am a working girl I work at pantaloons I have nothing to do with police They said nothing Now and then a cackle came from the radio on the dashboard far in front At some point a car filled with boys sped by and I heard whooping and cheering They were coming from a nightclub. A dodging police van meant nothing to these boys. They did not slow down. They were not afraid. Their fathers knew police commissioners and members of the legislature, figures who were capable of making all problems disappear. And me, how would I get out of this? Whom did I know? lovely at night after the acting class i am lying in bed with azad my husband my businessman who is buying and reselling samsung electronics and tolly hilfiger wristwatches from chinese ships docking in diamond harbor i am showing him my practice video from the day's class and he is saying i have been telling you for a hundred years you have star material in you he is pinching my cheek and i am laughing even though it is hurting i am feeling peaceful like this thin mattress on the floor is our own luxury five star hotel bed In this room I am having everything I am needing a jar of drinking water some dishes a small kerosene stove and a shelf for my clothes and jewelry on the wall giving me their blessings every day are Priyanka Chopra and Shah Rukh Khan when i am looking around i am seeing their beautiful faces and some of their good fortune is sprinkling down on me Azad I am saying this night my face is close to his face like we are in a romantic scene in a blockbuster promise me you will not get angry if i am telling you something i am taking a moment to look at his face dark and gray some long hairs in his eyebrows trying to escape I am having difficulty looking eye to eye for these hand words. Aren't you thinking I'm finally saying about family and all? We are not so young. End quote. As I this starting to talk over me like always. Again, he is saying I am knowing that he is annoyed. was my brother coming here no was my brother putting his rubbish in your head no i am telling you why azad is always excusing me of such things 
Everyone knows it is the way of the world, as it. I am telling him. Yes, the world is backward, and yes, the world is stupid. But your family is wanting you to marry a proper woman, have children. And look at me, I can never give you a future like that. Immediately, I am regretting. This is a great big mistake. I am wishing to be with Azad always. So why am I pushing him away? Actually, Azad is right. His brother was coming one night. He was coming before dawn, ringing the bell, banging his fist on the door. He was making such a racket. The street dogs were barking "gyu gyu." When I was finally leaping out of bed and unlatching the door, Azad's brother was immediately shouting at my face. Whatever curse you have given him, let him go, witch. Shh, I was saying. Be quiet, it's the middle of the night. Don't tell me what to do, witch, he was screaming, wagging a finger in the air. One man pissing in the gutter was looking at him, then at me, then at him, then at me. Otherwise, all was quiet and dark, but surely everybody was hearing everything. You have trapped him, his brother was screaming. Now you have to free him. Let him get mad at like a normal person. I was only standing holding the open door. Calm yourself, I was saying quietly. You will make yourself sick. I was wearing my nighty. My ears were burning. The whole neighborhood was learning my business. Now this was making me angry. Who was giving this good-for-nothing brother the right to shout at me in front of the whole locality? All these people were hard-working rickshaw pullers, fruit sellers, cotton fillers, maid servants, guards in the malls. They were needing sleep. Now what respect was I having left in my eyes? So finally I was shouting back some rude things. I don't like remembering them. Okay, I'm admitting to Azad now. Fine, your brother came. He was saying to me, Lovely, I know your love is true. My brother refuses to even eat if you are not there. But please, I am begging you, talk to him about marriage and children, for our old parents' sake. Azad is looking at me. My brother said that? He is not believing his ears. Yes, your own brother, I am saying. So I am thinking about it. A spider with thin brown legs is crawling through the window with all eight legs. It is exploring the wall. Both of us are watching it. When Azad is getting up and about to slap the spider with his shoe, I am saying, leave it. Why to always ruin other creatures' lives? No, Azad is saying. I am not going to follow such stupid rules. I will marry you. Jeevan The next morning at the courthouse, a policewoman opens for me a path through a crowd moving like they are joyous, like they are celebrating at a cricket stadium. The sun blazes in my eyes. I look at the ground. Jeevan, Jeevan, look here, shout reporters with cameras mounted on their shoulders or a raised tower above their heads. Some reporters reach forward to push recorders toward my mouth though some policemen beat them back. I am jostled and shoved my feet, stepped on, my elbows knocked into my ribs. 
these men shot questions. How did the terrorists make contact with you? When did you start planning the attack? I found my voice and shout, a brief cry which dies down like a rooster's. I am innocent. I don't know anything about a stand tall through the colors appear bright in my eyes, the greens of trees luminous as the mineral stream, the gu beneath my feet, composed of distinct particles. My legs buckle and the policewoman catches me. A shout goes up amongst the crowd. The policewoman's grip on my arm is the kindest thing. Then indoors, where the noise recedes, I am allowed to slump into a chair. A lawyer appointed to me appears. He is young, only a little older than me, though he has the pot belly of a wealthy man. Did you get food this morning? is the first thing he says. I look at my policewoman handlers and cannot remember. I nod. I am Gobin, he says, your court-appointed lawyer. Do you understand what lawyer means? It means that, sir, I began. I understand what it means. I went to school. I am a sales clerk at Pantaloons. You know that shop? You tell me this. Why am I arrested? Fine. I posted one stupid thing on Facebook. But I don't know anything about the train. The lawyer looks not at me but at a folder in his hands. He licks a finger and turns the pages. Are you telling the truth? He says. They found your chat records talking to the terrorist recruiter on Facebook. Everybody keeps saying this to me. But this boy was just someone I chatted with online. We were online friends, I plead. I don't know who he was. From my chair, I hear the wheeze of a chilling fan above me and the chatter of visitors entering the courtroom behind. In front, all I see is an auntie sitting at a typewriter Tendrils of hair slip loose from the coil at the base of her neck. On Facebook, I made many friends, including this friend in a foreign country. At least that's what he told me, I explained to Govind. This friend asked me about my life about and my feelings. I sent him emojis sometimes to say hello. Now they tell me he was a known terrorist recruiter. Known to whom? I didn't know any of this. Gobin looks at me. A woman like me is never believed. What about these cloths soaked in kerosene found at your house? Says Gobin after a while. Very much like the kerosene soaked torches that were tossed into the train. What about that? Those were, I think, hard. Probably my mother's cleaning cloths, kerosene to get grease off. I don't know. I have never seen them. They say I helped terrorists set fire to the train. Not only do they have Facebook chat records with a man I know who is a recruiter, I now know who is a recruiter. These were witnesses at the railway station who saw me walking to the train station with a package in my arms. Must have been kerosene, they say. Must have been rags or wood for torches. Other witnesses saw me running away from the train with no package in my arms. Though they saw no men with me, they alleged that I guided men, terrorists, enemies of the country, down the unnamed lanes of my slum to the station where the cursed train would be waiting. 
When I protest my innocence, they point to the seditious statements I posted on Facebook, calling my own government a terrorist and showing, so they say, a marked absence of loyalty to the state. Is this a crime to write some words on Facebook? Gobind points to a document assigned while in police lockup. He tells me I confessed. Who believes that? I charge. They forced me to sign it. They were beating me. I turned to the courtroom, wishing for my mother and father to be here for their soothing hand on my head, and at the same time, as I wish for them to never see me here. They would not be able to bear it. Then the judge arrives and reads a list of charges. Crimes against the nation, he says. Sedition. I hear the words. I raise my hand and gesture, no, no, no. I was taking a few books, my school books, I say. It is the truth. So why does it sound so meager? That was my package. I was taking my school books to a person in the slum. Her name is Lovely. Ask her. She will tell you that I was teaching her English for some months. From the back, a voice coughs. Keep your stories for the papers. A terrorist doing charity. What an A-plus story. The media will eat it up. The judge threatens to throw the voice out of the room. They made me sign the confession, I tell the judge later. I lift my tunic to reveal my bruised abdomen and hear people shift behind me. This time the judge listens, his eyebrows raised. Days later, in newspaper, I will see an artist's drawing of me appearing in court that morning. The sketch shows a woman with her hair in a braid. Her hands are cuffed but raised as in prayer or plea. This was a mistake, I think. I was not in cuffs, was I? The rest of her body is hastily penciled, decaying already. End of the recording for Thursday, June 18th, 2020, 3.41 p.m. This is Abhishek signing off. Thank you for listening.